excitement in the search and hopefully coming discovery. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here. It's an honor because the work of Professor Grelnick and his collaborators really sets the stage for our modern understanding of particle physics. And it's a privilege because I spent my entire professional career thinking about electroweak symmetry breaking, and I hope to convey to you some of the excitement that particle physicists have right now as we start a new era of particle physics. So, let's see, there's no laser point, right? Um, we, we have just turned on the Large Hadron Collider. The two icons here are from the two experiments, from the ATLAS experiment and the CMS experiment, which just began taking data. These pictures are from March 30th of this year. So it's a very recent uh, thing that we're actually talking about data from the LHC. Okay, well, the Large Hadron Collider is a proton-proton collider at CERN. This is a nice picture of the ring at CERN. The first collisions were at an energy of 7 TeV, March 30th, as I've said. The goal is to get to an energy of 14 TeV, which is approaching the speed of light. But the important thing about the LHC is really that the quarks and gluons within the proton have a typical energy of 1 to 2 TeV. So with the LHC, for the first time, we're probing the TeV energy scale. Okay. So we've been waiting a long time. In particular, people of my generation, we grew up and we were going to discover this physics at the Superconducting Super Collider in Waxahachie, Texas. The Superconducting Super Collider was a proton-proton machine with 40 TeV, so it would have had a higher energy than the LHC, and it was canceled in 1993. And mentioning it isn't really sour grapes, but just to point out that the physics that we were hoping to do in this machine, which was canceled in 1993, is the physics of the LHC, which we are finally approaching right now. Of course, we weren't just waiting. We found the top core. We found dark energy. But the physics of electroweak symmetry breaking, we built the SSC for it. Then we canceled it. Now we built the LHC for it. So we're, we finally have the tool we need to explore electroweak symmetry breaking. We were really stuck until we had the right tool to see what, the, what was happening there. So the LHC is running now at an energy of 7 TeV, at half energy. It will run until it collects about one inverse femtobarnet data. So the question is, what are we going to learn? Let me just show you the LHC plan, because it's kind of interesting. So we're at 2010 here with the red dot. By the end of the year, we expect to collect one inverse femtobarn in 2011. Then you see the curve is flat when they shut the machine down for a year. They upgrade it to an energy scale of about 14 TeV, maybe 13 TeV, but about uh, somewhere in that range. And then we start to accumulate luminosity. And you can see by 2013, the plan is to get about 10 inverse femtobarns, and by 2016, maybe 100 inverse femtobarns. So in the next six years or so, we expect somewhere on the order of 100 inverse femtobarns. So the first moral is that when the theorists get up and show you their plots with 300 inverse femtobarns, you should just, you know, go to sleep or something, because that'll be a while. But 10 inverse femtobarns, and you'll see in the Ulrich Heinz's talk later, that's enough to actually really discover this uh, particle. Okay. So the standard model in a nutshell. Standard model is an SU2 cross SU3 cross U1 gauge theory. I won't talk about SU3 at all. That's the strong interactions. The SU2 cross U1 gauge theory is the electroweak part. And the standard model breaks this SU2 cross U1 symmetry and generates a mass for the W and Z bosons, which is what we were hearing about earlier, by using a single scalar doublet, which I've called phi. After the symmetry is broken, and here's my cartoon down here, when the ball is sitting at the top, there's a symmetry when you rotate around it, but once the ball falls down the potential, you've broken this rotational symmetry. It generates a mass for the W and Z, and it leaves a physical scalar. Well, my colleagues had many suggestions as to what I should call this scalar. The one I liked best was the quantum of electroweak symmetry breaking, but I've called it the H particle, H for heavy. Okay, so it's the H particle because I have many graphs which are labeled M sub H. Um, all right. H for happy? Oh, that's true. It's a happy, heavy particle. That's good. I, next time I'll put a little smiley face. Um, it's a happy particle. So this is a physical scalar, and it's, it's a prediction of the theory. 
I have to have this physical scalar. So I'm going to present to you a rather pragmatic approach to electroweak symmetry. And that's how can we find that the symmetry is broken with this nice mechanism which generates masses for the W and Z? How can we explore this experimentally? Well, the first thing to notice is the scalar potential here, which depends on the modulus of phi dagger phi, has two parameters. One I call lambda and one I call V. V is actually measured in muon decay. It's 246 GeV, so it's not a free parameter. So lambda is the only free parameter. There's one free parameter. Lambda is actually the mass of the happy particle over 2V squared. So there's, there's one free parameter. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. I'm so used to having a pointer that it's hard for me to talk without it. So this is the only free parameter in the theory. This isn't a theory with a lot of fudge factors. Okay, so the scalar couplings are fixed. This particle H, the scalar, couples to fermion mass. So the largest coupling is to the heaviest fermion. So when we look for this particle, we're going to look for it decaying to B quarks if it's relatively light, or to W and Z bosons if it's a little bit heavier. So the heaviest fermion is the top quark, so the top scalar coupling plays a special role because it's essentially one. And the scalar doesn't couple to neutrinos because the neutrinos are approximately massless. The scalar couples to gauge balls on masses, so it doesn't couple directly to photons and gluons. So only one free parameter, the scalar mass. So I can calculate everything to as many loops as I have strength to calculate them. So everything's calculable, and that means that this is a testable theory. It's a theory test. We can falsify. We can verify. Okay. So we have a standard model. The standard model is this SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge theory with this SU2 doublet of scalars, one physical scalar remains. The standard model essentially explains all of our experimental data. Now, you can't see these numbers, but the point here is that these are a large number of experimental numbers. Here are the measurements with their errors. This model has one free parameter, the scalar mass. We can describe it by inputting three parameters, which are typically taken to the, the mass of the Z boson, the Fermi coupling, and the alpha electromagnetic. And then we can fit and predict all the rest of these things. So you can see this is the number of standard deviations the fit is from the experimental value. And you can see almost everything is in perfect agreement between the prediction of the fit and the experiment. So the experimental data is completely consistent with our standard model with a single scalar boson. I should also say there's absolutely no experimental evidence that this boson exists. Okay, so we can predict the W boson mass in this theory. So we can predict the W boson mass in terms of our three parameters, the Z mass, the electromagnetic coupling, and the Fermi constant. So the prediction is sensitive to the top and scalar masses. The prediction for the W mass depends quadratically on the top quark mass and logarithmically on the scalar mass. So the top quark mass restricts the scalar mass. That's one way to say it. So what this plot shows is the W mass and the top quark mass. So what we've measured the W mass and the top quark mass. So the, the blue curve here are the experimentally measured numbers. Well, now we can infer the values of the W mass and the top quark mass from this table of experimental results I showed you on the previous slide. That's this red curve. And you can see that they overlap. So this is a great triumph of the theory that we essentially predict the top quark mass from our precision measurements. So since the theory depends logarithmically on the scalar mass, it, it only changes a little bit as we go from a relatively light scale